Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, the greatest contiguous land empire the world had ever known, completely surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. Starting at the Strait of Gibraltar, which separates the continents of Europe and Africa, it comprised what is now Spain, Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Italy, the Balkans, Greece, and across the Black Sea, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and the whole of North Africa back again to the Strait of Gibraltar, a fantastic panorama. In an historically brief period of time, tiny Rome sent out its legions to conquer what to them was the world. Roman emperor ruled his vast domain. His troops and his governors controlled provinces from the icy north to the burning sands of the south. His power was absolute and awesome. The Roman Empire was a complex business. Well-engineered Roman roads ran in every direction, carrying commerce and the all-important legions which helped maintain the iron Roman rule. All the great lands of antiquity were subject to Roman domination. To the north, Athens, the center of world culture. To the east, Antioch in Syria, center of commerce and also pleasure and vice, and then to the south, from the great Egyptian seaport of Alexandria, there flowed grain, which fed the empire. To be a Roman was truly to be a citizen of the world. And here, far from the splendor of the great cities of the empire, lay the small province of Palestine, as the Romans called it. As yet unimportant in the scales of empire, and yet the crossroads between Europe and Asia and Africa. It was vital. It had always been vital. Here in this remote province, Yeshua, Jesus, was born. To understand the meaning of that birth, we must understand this land, which has been conquered and reconquered ever since the beginning of man himself. The oldest city in this oldest land is Jericho, a city famous for the walls which came tumbling down at the sound of Joshua's trumpets. But in 1952, Kathleen Kenyon, a British archaeologist, discovered far older walls dating several thousand years before the pyramids of Egypt, making Jericho the oldest walled city to be found anywhere in the world. But the most startling find at Jericho were these odd-looking human skulls. Covering each skull is a layer of plaster, carefully shaped to resemble the face of a living human being. The dead were buried under the floor of the house, but their skulls were kept with the family. This ensured that the wisdom of the ancestors would be preserved for their descendants. Infants who had little wisdom to pass on were buried intact. The earliest people of Jericho were not Israelites. Father Abraham would not be born for several thousand years. 
But why build here, 800 feet below sea level, where summer temperatures reach a sizzling 130 degrees? One answer may well lie with the Dead Sea, only five miles away. This is the saltiest body of water on the face of the Earth. To ancient man, salt was more than worth its weight in gold. Without it, staples of meat and fish would last only a few hours on a sweltering summer day. For hundreds of miles around, Jericho's merchants literally provided the salt of the earth. Then abruptly, about 2300 BC, the Amorites swept out of the desert, tumbling Jericho's sturdy walls. From Jericho, the Amorites struck north and then far, far to the east until they came upon the ultimate battle prize, Ur of the Chaldees, the birthplace of Abraham. Abraham was the first Israelite the father of the Jewish people, ancestor of Jesus, and the root of our story. Abraham has often been considered a poor, illiterate nomad, economically backward and culturally deprived, but nothing could be farther from the truth. He was born in the splendor that was Ur, once the richest, most technologically advanced, most powerful city in the world. For thousands of years, that splendor lay hidden under a mountain of sand in eastern Iraq, under a mound something like this one, which local Arabs long insisted concealed Abraham's Ur of the Chaldees. Ur Junction was no more than a lonely stop on the night train from Baghdad when archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley arrived in 1922. It took several years to free the mound from the rubble and sand that had buried it for millennia. The southwest face ultimately revealed an enormous structure of ancient mud brick. But the northeast face unveiled a far more dramatic surprise. It was a terraced temple tower known to scholars as a ziggurat. <laughs> When Abraham witnessed the regular religious processions in front of this imposing structure, it had been standing at least 1,700 years. The ziggurat featured a stairway by which man could ascend to meet the gods. The ziggurat of Ur honored the moon god, Nana. No doubt this was once Abraham's foremost god. His shrine occupied the summit of the ziggurat. Its blue color matched the sky, the moon god's natural abode. This tall figure is Abu, the god of vegetation, and the smaller statues are his human worshipers. Wraparound skirts with a border of sheepskin tufts at the bottom were formal attire in Abraham's time. Five years after the excavations began, Sir Leonard Woolley happened upon Ur's Royal Cemetery. Here he found 10 musicians from Ur's Royal Court, wearing finery of gold, Lapis lazuli imported from Persia and carnelian. One of the court musicians lay across the ruins of a harp, her fingers still touching its silent strings.
Nearby was a ram in front of a golden tree. Using technology millennia ahead of their time, Ur's craftsmen fashioned the ram's body from silver, its fleece from carved shells. Everywhere lay priceless objects bearing mute testimony to a civilization advanced beyond all others. Sir Leonard Woolley was awestruck. In his published journals, he proclaimed to the world that Abraham's civilization possessed technical skills at least 2,000 years in advance of its time. Every generation of children has had its toys. This may be the oldest of them all. As a little boy, Abraham probably played with a toy like this, it was drawn across the floor in this way, and it is significant that it had wheels, like the wheels of this toy chariot. It's generally thought that these people invented the wheel. And we're reminded by the trade on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that it's not surprising they should also have invented the sail, incredibly advanced as they were. It's generally accepted that they also invented writing. This is a letter from the time of Abraham. It's a little clay tablet about the size of a modern postage stamp. It's written on both sides and also on the ends. And then hardened in the sun, and sent by messenger to its destination. A little more sophisticated than that was this contract, which was inserted into its envelope and then sealed by the witnesses to be recorded in the archives. Abraham's civilization was among the first to develop mathematics as something more than just counting. These people understood fractions, square roots, cube roots, and even geometry. And all of this was learned in a school that was called the Tablet House. The teacher was called the father of the Tablet House. And the monitor was called the big brother with the stick. The stick was frequently used in the learning process. Shina. Shina. Shalashat. Shalashat. Erbet. These children are counting in Akkadian, the language used by Abraham himself. And they've learned to write Abraham's cuneiform script. Written in that ancient language is an old schoolboy essay of which we have many ancient copies. It tells about the bad day in the life of a student in Abraham's time. I got up too late for breakfast and I had to hurry away to school. So I begged my mother for two rolls. She gave me two rolls of bread and I hurried away to school. When I got there, the monitor said, why are you late? I stepped inside the school and stood with my heart pounding before the teacher. I bowed low and he forgave me. But a little later on, when I left the tablet house without permission, the big brother with a stick caned me several times. Later on for talking in school, I was caned again. But the worst came when the big brother with the stick said to me, nobody can ever read your handwriting. When I got home that night, I talked to my father and complained about my bad marks. He invited the father of the tablet house to dinner, set him in a seat of honor, gave him a jar of oil, a robe, some money, and even a ring on his finger. Then the voice of the father of the tablet house began to change in tone. And he said, this son of the tablet house will ascend to the pinnacles of the art of writing. The day will come when he will be first among his brothers. Since there are so many ancient copies of this essay, it is obvious that Sumerian teachers loved it and gave it as an exercise to their pupils. This was Abraham's land of Ur. This was the civilization so far advanced above all others that the Amorites coveted it as a battle prize. The army of Ur was ready. In the royal cemetery, Sir Leonard Woolley had found a mosaic of Ur's war machine. The characters are rendered in an almost comic style, but Ur's army was not to be laughed at. 
Its war chariots, still unknown in other civilizations, were pulled along by onagers that literally ran down the enemy. Those who escaped faced the charioteers with their drawn javelins, or the mighty infantry brandishing battle axes and spears. Had another ancient enemy not attacked from the east as the Amorites attacked from the west, Ur's great Sumerian empire surely would have survived. Abraham's Ur fell, crushed under the heavy heel of the Amorites. Their ziggurat was destroyed. The gilded statue of the all-powerful moon god was carried off in derision. A poet of that period lamented, Woe, my city! Woe, my house! The gods have departed. There is no one left to hear the cry for help. But the cry was heard not by Ur's splendid gilded image, but by the invisible unknown God who spoke in silence, promising Abraham that from the ashes of Ur would come new nations. And Abraham would be the father of those nations. So Abraham, following his God's direction, took his family and a few followers and moved north and westward down the great plain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and then south through the valley of the Jordan. The book of Genesis says, Abraham was a very rich man with sheep, goats and cattle, as well as silver and gold. The refugee from Ur was rich in everything but land. Even for a spot to pitch his tent, he was dependent on the hospitality of the Amorites, who now controlled most of the land of Canaan. In a vision, the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, Look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever, and I will be their God. As the vision continued, the Lord said, your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. A little more than a hundred years later, the vision began to come true. The descendants God had promised Abraham went down to Egypt in search of food. There they dwelt, first as strangers, then as slaves. Two, three, finally 400 years passed. The Amorites were being driven out of the land of Canaan according to God's promise. Then the Egyptians, striking from their rich ribbon of land along the Nile, established an empire all along the coast of the Mediterranean. As far north as Megiddo and Hatsor, they set up their chariot cities, fortresses from which they could launch their lightning strikes. 4,000-year-old wooden soldiers depict Egypt's irresistible armored columns, which swept like a flood tide up the entire length of the crescent. When the Israelites were captive in Egypt, Egypt controlled the promised land. The Egyptians had a lasting influence on the conquered peoples of Palestine. Scarabs, symbols of Egyptian life after death, were manufactured in many cities of Palestine, including Jericho. Even in death, the conquered peoples of Palestine copied their Egyptian masters, 
These sarcophagi containing skeletons look like a child's drawing of the beautiful and sophisticated mummy cases of the Egyptian dead. They were found among the Canaanites, the Philistines, and the Sea People. Back in Egypt, the Israelites drank the sweat of misery as slave laborers under a succession of pharaohs. They were born, ground out their lives, and died beneath the whip. known as Ramses the Great, and great he was. The precocious boy king became a captain in the army and was given a harem at the unheard of age of 10. Looking at his features in the monumental stone portrait at Abu Simbel, we can see a subtle, self-satisfied smile playing about his mouth. Clearly, he was a pampered and pleasure-loving monarch. Ramsay's marriages brought him 79 sons and 59 daughters, whom he proudly depicted on the walls of his temples. But Ramses II was known as Ramses the Great for more than his virility. Not since the pyramid-building pharaohs had Egypt seen a more ambitious construction program. Nearly half the temples in Egypt bear the marks of his handiwork. He built two virtually new cities, one immodestly named after himself, the House of Ramses. And his name appears everywhere. Ramses' construction, like that of the pharaohs before him, was accomplished by forced labor. Egyptian wall paintings show foremen beating the slaves. The Bible identifies those slaves as Israelites. The labor to erect Ramses' colossal statue at the Ramesseum was enough to crush the stoutest spirit. This monument was sculpted from a single piece of granite and then handed over to slaves to move by hand. The poet Shelley has immortalized this colossus now fallen. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Ozymandias is Greek for one of Ramses' royal names, which he ordered carved within a loop of rope with the ends tied together. It signified that he ruled over all the sun encircled. When Moses appeared before Pharaoh, this was the proud monarch who refused to let God's people go. It was not until God caused the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt, including the Pharaoh's son, that the king called for Moses and said, get out, you and your Israelites. 
At the famous Red Sea, Pharaoh had a change of heart. Sending 600 chariots to recapture the fleeing slaves, the king tried to match wits and muscle with the Lord God of Israel. He lost ignominiously. Today, Hebrew cantors still sing the great victory song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord because he has won a glorious victory. He has thrown the horses and their riders into the sea. While the body of Ramses II exists today only as a leathery mummy, and his throne has long since crumbled, the song of Moses concludes, you, Lord, will be king forever and ever. So with the parting of the Red Sea, the escape of the Israelites, the destruction of the Egyptians, the people of God moved back to their promised land. They fought for it every inch of the way and every minute of all the centuries. And then a little more than half a century before Jesus was born, the Romans came. Led by Pompey himself, Rome's crack legions marched into Palestine. In three brief months, Jerusalem would fall, and Israel would become a puppet state of the Roman Empire. Fleeing the terror of war in Jerusalem, a 10-year-old boy sought the safety of his grandfather's home in Arabia. Who would have guessed that in 25 years, Caesar Augustus would ask the Roman Senate to crown this boy, Herod, King of the Jews? Here in Rome to receive the kingly wreath, Herod's eyes grew wide with wonder. Though we see only ruins today, he saw Rome in all its glory. Aqueducts to supply the ubiquitous Roman baths. The Circus Maximus, where a quarter million spectators shouted themselves hoarse at the famous Roman games. The Forum with the House of the Vestals, perpetual virgin priestesses. Everywhere were marble temples, and everywhere were marble statues. It is said that Augustus found Rome brick and left it marble. The coast of Palestine is virtually devoid of natural harbors. In imitation of Caesar, Herod, newly crowned king of the Jews, marked out an area second in size only to the massive port of Alexandria. Then he lowered 30-ton blocks of stone into the sea, building a gigantic mole to break the force of even the most treacherous waves. Herod had performed a building feat worthy of Augustus himself. Now Israel had a harbor. But a harbor needs a city. And since a city cannot exist on salt water, Herod, taking a cue from Caesar, built an aqueduct, a Roman aqueduct. Nearby, he built a Roman city with marble streets and marble statues. With an amphitheater for entertainment in the Roman fashion. He named his Roman city Caesarea, after his mentor, Caesar Augustus. Here once stood a temple to Caesar, which Herod built in flagrant violation of the law of Moses. This gigantic statue rivaling the Olympian Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the world, impressed Caesar. 
but inflamed the Jews. One day would come a reckoning. Although it is known that Herod built several statues in honor of himself, the modern world saw no trace of them until 1873. Then an Arab donkey driver removing stones from a wall being demolished on a site north of Jerusalem came upon an ancient bust. This plaster cast of that bust shows the head of Herod the Great. The back of the head is missing owing to mutilation in ancient times. The tip of the nose is chipped. This is Herod the Great, in whose reign was born Jesus of Nazareth. Encircling the head is the laurel wreath he received in Rome. On top of that, the medallion with the Roman eagle at the center, the symbol of Roman power, which Herod wielded in Palestine on behalf of Rome. However angry the Jews were with Herod for erecting statues of himself and temples to Caesar, they would never forget the magnificent temple he built to the God of Israel in Jerusalem. This is a scale model of the temple, very much as it appeared in Herod's day. It covered 36 acres, the equivalent of six city blocks. The main public entrance was called the Hulda Gates. From them, ramps led inward and upward to the court of the Gentiles. It was a place non-Jews could worship God in an otherwise Jewish temple. Here, Agrippa, the right-hand man of Caesar Augustus, offered 100 oxen to the God of Israel on behalf of Rome. Porches surrounding the court of the Gentiles were supported by a double row of columns 40 feet high, cut from single blocks of the whitest marble. This is called the royal porch because tradition held that here Solomon was anointed king. Behind these portals, overlaid by Herod with gold and silver and called the beautiful gate, was the court of the women. called the court of the women because it represented the limit beyond which women could not go, it covered the expanse of one and a half modern football fields. During worship, these 15 steps held choirs of chanting Levites. Here Joseph and Mary would one day present the infant Jesus to the Lord. <laughs> In the inner court stood the famous altar of burnt offering, rising 22 feet high with four corners jutting out at the top like horns. The facade of the sanctuary was decorated by four half pillars pointing 150 feet upward. They supported a row of gold-covered spikes designed to prevent birds from perching on the temple parapet. Rabbi said, whoever has not seen Herod's temple has not seen a beautiful building. Two huge mosques now occupy only a fraction of the space that once was the temple, heart of Israel. Silver Dome del Aqsa and the Golden Dome of the Rock. In the past few years, extensive excavations have been made on the southern wall. The archaeologists have dug through the usual Turkish, Arabic, Crusader, 
Arabic and Byzantine layers of buildings. They have exposed the base of the southern wall. Here it meets the western wall. It is possible to get some idea of the size and excellence of Herod's engineering. Remember that the original wall was double the height of what is left. Mr. Ben Dove is the director of excavation for both the southern and the western walls of the temple area in Jerusalem. We are sitting on the steps of the temple where Jesus stood and where one other man might have stood too, an unusual man, the man who built this temple. That's right, the man who built the, stem, the, the steps and all this area was Herod the, the king, Herod, Herod the Great. How would you compare the quality and the uh, impressiveness of this temple with other buildings in the Roman Empire at that time? I think that speaking on temples, that was the largest in, the, in that world and maybe the largest in the world at all as a temple. Did he have any problems with the people in Rome over the building of the temple? Uh, he had, not that he had problems, but he was afraid that it might be a problem, and uh, he did not know whether to ask them or not, to ask the Caesar in Rome uh, to get license for building here a temple, because it was kind of a fortification, you know, was, uh, huge uh, walls of 30 meters, 90 feet high. One of the people told him, we have to start, first of all, building the temple, and at the meantime, we should send someone to Rome to ask for permission. They sent the man, and he went one year to Rome. Because, you know, you can go straight to Rome, but you can travel all over Europe till you are coming there. And he was waiting for one year there. And then he came back uh, in one year. Three, three years, that was the time that they finished to build the whole uh, area here. The answer of the Caesar, by the way, was if they did not start, not to start. If they are, yes, if they are in the middle, to, to stop there. If they finished, what can we do? It's finished, it's finished. Yeah. And uh, that was the story. Seeing these huge stones, these megaliths, it seems incredible that even one of them could have been moved by hand, much less the thousands it took to build this temple. And then equally incredible that the entire superstructure could have been completed in only three years. This megalith, for example, weighs over 200 tons. The stones the Egyptians used to build the pyramids, by comparison, weighed only 15 tons. How did Herod's workmen raise a wall of such gigantic blocks to the height of 90 feet? The Turks, the Arabs, and the Crusaders who rebuilt this wall long after Herod could not duplicate this tremendous accomplishment. It's easy to distinguish their lightweight rubble from Herod's gigantic limestone blocks. The latest explanation of how Herod moved these enormous stones comes from a little-known excavation north of the prayer area of the Temple Mount, known as the Wailing Wall. Far in the background is a black door concealing a 600-foot tunnel which Jewish archaeologists have been quietly excavating since the Six-Day War. Opposite what may have been the holy place of the temple, the granddaddy of all megaliths has been discovered. It measures 46 feet long, 10 feet high, and 10 feet wide, and weighs an astonishing 415 tons. Engineers once theorized that Herod's stones were pushed to the temple site on log rollers. They now agree that a 415-ton megalith would have crushed the stoutest logs to a pulp. In the same tunnel, a mystery stone was found. One side is perfectly flat, and the other side is smoothly curved. Why would Herod's masons have quarried a megalith with this contour? 
A third stone, located in one of Herod's quarries a half mile north of the Temple Mount, may hold the key. Obviously, it's round, cylindrical. Apparently, it was discarded by Herod's masons because it cracked. Could it be that all the temple megaliths were quarried round, then rolled down a specially constructed ramp into the temple area and maneuvered into position? while the great slabs, like the one found in the rabbinical tunnel, were chiseled off on all four sides in order to achieve the final rectangular shape. The answer lies with Palestine's incredible builder, Herod, whose architectural genius earned him the title Herod the Great. Herod's temple would have ingratiated him to Jewish hearts forever had he not first erected his pagan abominations here in the holy city. This is a hippodrome built to promote Herod's favorite pastime, the Roman games. Some archeologists believe it stood in the very shadow of the temple. Gladiators fighting to the death while spectators cheered, deeply offended the religious Jews. So did wild beast hunts with animals deliberately starved to a maddening frenzy. Likewise, the horrifying sadism of throwing Jewish criminals to the lions as a public sport. Whole sections of the Jewish population rose in bitter protest. An attempt was made to assassinate Herod on the very premises of his abominable games. The spectacular jewel of a temple helped cool Herod's angry subjects. Herod, as a builder, deserved his title, Herod the Great. He was convinced that he had founded a kingdom that would endure forever. To ensure succession, he married many times, had many children, to make sure that there would always be a Herod, king of the Jews. For the first time since Solomon, the boundaries of the Jewish kingdom, Herod's kingdom, covered all the land which God had promised to Abraham's descendants forever. Herod considered himself the personification of that promise. He was indeed the king of the Jews. And so he was doubly startled when here in his palace at Jerusalem, he received visitors, astrologers from the eastern lands in search of a particular star. They claimed heralded the birth of a great king. Where, these astrologers asked the man who had spent his life building a secure throne, is the one born king of the Jews. <laughs> 